Let me start now by introducing uh, our discussants for the evening. I want to start uh, with Lynn, Lynn Oberlander, uh, known to most of you. Uh, Lynn is the Senior Vice President and Associate General Counsel for Media for Univision Communications. Uh, she was previously Executive Vice President and General Counsel for Gizmodo Media Group. Prior to that, she was uh, General Counsel for Media Operations at First Look Media and uh, the, the publisher of the national security website, The Intercept. She founded and led that company's Press Freedom, Lit Press Freedom Litigation Fund, which provides funding for cases in support of First Amendment and other press freedoms. From 2006 to 2014, she was the general counsel of The New Yorker, where she also wrote for NewYorker.com on media law topics. Earlier in her career, she spent five years each at Forbes and NBC. She teaches a graduate course in media corporate responsibility in the law, both in a traditional classroom setting and online at the New School in New York. She is a former chair of both the board of directors of the Media Law Resource Center and the Communications and Media Law Committee of the state New York State Bar Association. Um, Lynn will be uh, interviewing our author uh, and uh, guest of honor tonight, Professor Stanley Fish. Uh, professor Fish is the Davidson Kahn Distinguished University Professor of Humanities and Law at Florida International University and a visiting professor uh, to our great benefit, a visiting professor of law at Cardozo University. He has previously taught at UCAL Berkeley, Johns Hopkins, Duke and the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he was Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. He's received many honors and awards, including being named the Chicagoan of the Year for Culture. He is the author of many books, including Winning Arguments, and also How to Write a Sentence and How to Read One. <laughs> Professor Fish is a former weekly columnist for the New York Times. His essays and articles have appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Harper's Magazine, Esquire, and the Atlantic. We are delighted to have both of you here today. I think what we're going to do just for format purposes, let me say one word about that, is that we will, uh, Professor Fish will uh, give some introduction to what his book is about since most of us have not had the, I, I've had the privilege of reading it, but since we're selling it now, uh, unless you all are speed readers, you won't have read it yet. Uh, and then Lynn will begin by uh, engaging in some conversation with him, some questions to him about the book. Uh, and then we will open it up after that for questions from both people here in New York and by video from folks in, in Washington. And we'll try and wrap up by about eight o'clock. So with that, I'll turn it over to you and thank you again for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Fish, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming out this evening. It's also a pleasure to be in a room uh, structured so that wherever I look, I see a large representation of my book. <laughs> I'm trying to think of perhaps a redecoration of my apartment that might go uh, in that direction, but no doubt uh, my wife would object, and that, and that would be it. Uh, let me say something uh, briefly uh, uh, in the way of autobiography, although that's not uh, the mode that I uh, prefer usually. But it might set the stage for some questions and some uh, queries. Uh, I am the son of an immigrant father uh, who came to this country in 1923 at the age of 15. And I was the first not only in my immediate family, but as far as I can tell, in my family as it existed in the world, the great world, to attend college. Uh, so that it's always, uh, a, a, I'm always amazed uh, to find out that somehow I have stumbled in uh, to the academic life uh, and uh, been able uh, to experience uh, its uh, pleasures. Uh, and therefore, I assume, uh, to surprise uh, all of my ancestors who would look at me just as my father used to look at me, wondering, what is it exactly that you do? <laughs> I was never able to explain it. Uh, uh, the, I, I am sure the fault was mine and not his. The second autobi autobiographical point, which is more relevant perhaps uh, to our discussion today, is that I don't have a law degree. Uh, I did not go to law school. I audited a few courses given by a few friends, uh, but that's about it. Uh, and I wandered into uh, the law in the middle 70s by a route that I could explain if we had uh, more time, 
and I've been hanging around uh, law schools and teaching in them now and writing in law reviews and elsewhere for about 40 years. Uh, and so uh, the law world, although it is not my natural home or a home to which I am entitled by way of education and training, simply hasn't been able to get rid of me, uh, for which I am very grateful because I uh, enjoy moving around in it. Now for the book. Uh, one thing to note about the book, and perhaps a key thing, is the subtitle, How to Think About Hate Speech, Campus Speech, Religious Speech, Fake News, Post-Truth, and Donald Trump. I should say what I uh, told Lynn, uh, I believe, earlier, uh, that the title was, uh, when I presented it to my publisher, longer uh, subtitle. <laughs> it included, in addition to these uh, words and phrases, uh, it included post, uh, postmodernism and transparency. Uh, but something had to go, and it was postmodernism uh, and transparency that went. Uh, I wanted to emphasize what is obvious, that the title is how to think about, not what to think about. And that's important, because in this book, as in the many hundreds of columns that I wrote for the New York Times over the years, I'm usually not in the business of telling people what to do or of coming down on one side or the other of an issue. Rather, I consider myself to be in the business of, un, as I put it, unpacking arguments, uh, moving into some field of inquiry, usually in these days, these days a legal field of inquiry, but sometimes a philosophical field of inquiry, and then looking at the landscape. How are the arguments lined up? Which of them uh, is in the ascendancy? How did that happen? Uh, do they hold up? In what ways do they uh, cohere? What, are their, uh, what is the historical provenance of the set of ideas that now seems to many uh, to be uniquely powerful? How can they be challenged and dislodged? Those are the kinds of questions uh, that I typically ask and answer, so much so uh, that one uh, reader of mine in the New York Times I used to get about 400 responses to each of my columns, and by my own count, 390 of them were hostile uh, uh, every, every time. Uh, and one reader said, Fish, you're driving me crazy, because I can't tell where you stand on that issue. I forget what the issue was, but it could have been any issue. Uh, that doesn't mean that I don't have a general thesis or point of view to put forward in the book. Uh, and that general thesis is quite easily described. Uh, it's that the First Amendment is not a standalone thing, and that there is no essential First Amendment doctrine that then uh, uh, gets realized in particular and different situations. Rather, there are particular and different situations in the context of which what I call First Amendment rhetoric uh, is uh, invoked and then often uh, manipulate it. Uh, I'll just take off this privilege and read a couple of sentences which say just about that. Uh, free speech, freedom of speech is not a discrete value. You can't carve speech out uh, and pay homage to it and iso in isolation from the actions from which it is inextricable. Free speech is not, despite Robert Jackson's memorable pronouncement, the fixed star in our constitutional constellation, uh, the abiding light that will guide us through the kaleidoscope of circumstances if only we keep our eyes on it. In fact, I assert, there is nothing fixed about free speech doctrine at all. It's a grab bag of analogies, invented for the occasion arguments, rhetorical slogans, shaky distinctions, and ad hoc exceptions to those distinctions, all combining to make it an artifact of the very pol politics it supposedly transcends, at least in the version of it that we receive daily from the American Civil Liberties <coughs> Union. That's a mouthful, that is the sentence I just read, uh, but what it means is that, quote, and I'm quoting myself, the First Amendment is a participant in the partisan battle, a prize in the political wars, and not an apolitical oasis of principle. That's the first thesis of the book. The second thesis is that there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so that's to, to uh, set up. Now, 
So what I do is try to explore in a series of different contexts represented by uh, the chapters uh, of the book, how this moving body of rhetoric, almost a Nietzschean phrase, how this movie, moving body of rhetoric works in a number of situations. And I find that it works very differently in different situations and always in ways that are problematic. Here are the five titles of the five uh, substantive chapters. Uh, for those of you who haven't yet gotten your eager hands on the book. Chapter one, why censorship is a precondition of free speech. Chapter two, why hate speech cannot be defined. Chapter three, why freedom of speech is not an academic value. Chapter four, why the religion clause of the First Amendment doesn't belong in the Constitution. And chapter five, why transparency is the mother of fake news. So in each of those contexts, and you can see that they are varied, trying to ask questions like, what's going on here in relation to what we're told is going on? So that, for example, and this is the last example that I will cite, in the chapter on the academy, why free speech is not an academic value, I make a firm distinction between freedom of speech and freedom of inquiry. Freedom of speech, a democratic value uh, that tells us, among other things, uh, that all citizens have the right to be heard. Uh, of course, uh, given the resources that some of us have and some of us don't have, uh, that right uh, cannot always be operationalized. But all citizens have the right to be heard and no voices uh, should be stigmatized in advance, nor should any voices be declared holy and unimpeachable in advance. That's the, the shape, you might say, of freedom of speech doctrine um, in uh, the political sphere. But in the academic sphere, it's exactly the opposite. The academy, I argue, is an engine of exclusion, that the entire business of most academics is to decide which voices are going to be silenced. And more voices are silenced than are finally heard. And I'm thinking of promotion committees, hiring committees, the editors of learned journals, chancellors, uh, provosts, all of whom are regularly in the business of saying to a large number of people, sorry, but what you have to say is not something that we, in fact, uh, wish uh, to be uh, heard uh, in these precincts. So freedom of inquiry demands what freedom of speech in the political sense doesn't allow, an exclusion and vetting of voices. And then I go on to explore in the chapter what this means and why, among other things, it means that there are finally very few free speech issues in academic life. So that's typical. That's the way this book uh, works. Uh, it's the way I've always worked. I present a thesis which seems at first outrageous and outlandish and impossible to defend. And then I defend it by backing away from it, inch by inch, uh, until in the end, I sound as reasonable as anyone could ever <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I, I did read your book, and uh, I read it, and it was, I found it completely thought-provoking. And I, of course, I completely recommend it to everyone here. I mean, one of the tremendous things uh, Professor Fish does is he uh, synopsizes, you know, an entire several courses uh, in both political theory and First Amendment theory into several pages with a couple footnotes, but it's completely worthwhile from that point. However, um, I, I read the book. I have many notes. I have questions. But then I read the press release, and it says that um, in your signature style, you argue. I, and I'm just going to go to the fourth one, so I'll read them all. Donald Trump's claims of fake news are neither literal nor wholly incorrect. The NFL was correct to stay out of the Colin Kaepernick debate. Big tech much, must take a leading role in placing restrictions on internet speech. And the fourth is the one I want to come back to. New York Times uh, v. Sullivan was incorrectly ruled and puts our freedom of speech at immense <laughs> risk. Now, I've got to tell you, I read the book... I didn't see that. And then when I read this, I went back and looked at the index uh, up New York Times v. Sullivan. I read it again. I still didn't really see it. So I'm hoping that you can explain well, I don't what know. this uh, is here. Well, first of all, it's a press release. <laughs> 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 and therefore put out by people who want to sell the book, uh, if only because they've given me an exorbitant advance. I don't know why they did that. <laughs> I wouldn't have done it, but I wasn't going to say no, and I didn't say no. 
so now that I did say yes, they have to sell this thing, aside from you know providing a very, I think, eye-catching cover uh, for it. So of those things that you listed, uh, there are a couple there that I think uh, are in fact the case. I do uh, argue uh, uh, for that the uh, uh, National Football League, or at least the uh, owners of the, uh, of the uh, San Francisco 49ers, were well within their rights to decide that they didn't want someone like Colin Kaepernick uh, on their team uh, because they uh, didn't want to be associated uh, with the political views he expressed by taking a, uh, by taking, uh, a knee. Another way to put this, it's very simple, the National Football League is not in the free speech business. Uh, it's in the business uh, of, uh, uh, of, of growing an enterprise, which is largely a commercial and to some extent a cultural enterprise. And therefore, if one of its uh, employees says something uh, which is uh, detrimental, which is at least arguably detrimental uh, to the enterprise or does something that is uh, arguably detrimental to the enterprise, uh, the NFL is perfectly within its rights, or at least the individual owners, as long as they are not colluding, it's, uh, within its rights uh, uh, to uh, dis dismiss or punish uh, an employee. And I said the same thing in a, in a uh, uh, Daily News op-ed a couple of weeks ago about the more recent controversy uh, where the assistant general manager uh, of the uh, Houston Rockets uh, a really dim bulb, it would seem, <laughs> uh, tweeted out uh, uh, support freedom, uh, 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 support Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, then there was a, bash, a backlash uh, to his having said that because China, as you probably know, is the uh, largest uh, growing market for the NBA and there are untold millions and hundreds of millions of basketball fans uh, in that country. And then there was a backlash to the backlash, uh, saying that uh, we, uh, in fact, Mitch McConnell said this, uh, the NBA should be wary, uh, said uh, Senator McCon McConnell, uh, of privileging profits over free speech. To which I replied, that's their business. That's what they're supposed to be doing, privileging profits over free uh, speech. Uh, but there are a couple of those things that I would never say. Well, so do you think New York Times v. Sullivan was incorrectly decided, as the press release suggests? Uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, I know that New York Times v. Sullivan is, the, is a favorite uh, decision of, of a strong First Amendment proponents. And I know, if I recall correctly, Floyd, uh, when it, you, didn't you say that it was the, should be the occasion of dancing in the streets? No. Is that a legend? A great professor said that. Okay. <laughs> At any rate, uh, to my mind, what the what uh, I, I'm interested, as you all are, uh, I know, in the history of the First Amendment, um, and uh, up until the key decisions uh, issued uh, initially as dissents uh, by Brandeis and Holmes, uh, the doctrine that ruled was something uh, uh, was uh, something. The doctrine that ruled was that there were certain forms of speech uh, that uh, were uh, obviously uh, uh, so objectionable uh, that uh, they did not in fact deserve constitutional protection. And uh, this was then followed, as you all know, uh, by various iterations uh, of, the, uh, of the argument made uh, by Brandeis uh, and Holmes that no one must take into account uh, the imminence of the danger uh, that uh, was posed by some speech and then make uh, careful judgments on that basis. At that point in the history, and we're talking about, let's say, the 1920s, there were two concerns. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, there were two concerns, uh, and those concerns had to do both with content and effects. So it was thought that the content of speech could itself be suspect, and certainly if speech could be shown to have certain effects, that would be a matter of concern and perhaps a warrant for regulation uh, and indeed uh, at some point censorship. What New York Times versus Sullivan does, among other things, uh, 
is remove content and effect and instead substitute for that the idea that speech in and of itself is to be valued uh, because it's, and in, this includes falsehoods and defamations <coughs> in certain circumstances, uh, is to be valued because it contributes, and this is a famous phrase, to a robust, uninhibited, and wide open discussion in the democratic process. And I've always thought of that phrase, wide, robust, wide open, and uninhibited, as the John Wayne theory uh, of, of, of the First Amendment. Uh, and I think that was simply wrong. I think that it's simply wrong. Uh, uh, and I think it, it uh, placed too much faith in something that is called the marketplace of ideas, one of the shakiest notions ever to come down the philosophical pike. Uh, and I think it depended on an assumption about the way human beings work uh, when they are presented with speech, which in fact doesn't hold. Uh, so I don't like that decision at all. No, thank you. And, and uh, you know, obviously that sets us up for some of your other discussions in the book, which is that if, if the marketplace of ideas can't be trusted, and, or maybe it can be trusted in the very long view, as, as yeah. you write, yeah. and not necessarily in the shorthand, in the short view, um, in the short time view, because it does have harms, you seem to suggest, although you don't actually explicitly say it, that the, the internet barons uh, the Zuckerbergs of the world should, in fact, take it upon themselves to regulate some of what is passing over their platforms. No, I don't say that, but I can see why someone reading these pages uh, might think that I was on the way to saying that. Mm -hmm. But I stopped short of saying that because of the uh, principle of composition and thought I announced earlier, that I'm in the business of unpacking arguments. So most of what I say about the internet people uh, not only uh, Facebook, but uh, Twitter and various others uh, uh, in the book, is that they are caught between two competing desires, which have in fact been articulated uh, many times by Mark Zuckerberg. They want their platforms to do good, on the one hand, and they want to respect, uh, they want to respect the right of all persons uh, to speak without censorship and monitoring on the other. Uh, and they're finding out uh, that, uh, to their uh, dismay, that these two desires clash with one another. And they are, Zuckerberg uh, and uh, who's the head of Twitter, Jack? Dorsey. Dorsey, Dorsey. and others, uh, and also some, some First Amendment theorists uh, like uh, Tim Wu and Larry Lessig, have now been, uh, not, if not a, a repudiating, at least uh, casting a backward look uh, at their early championing of the meritocracy or democratization that was supposed to come along uh, with the internet. The idea that uh, if there were more and more speech and if that speech uh, were unfiltered, not curated, uh, not, uh, uh, not uh, monitored by gatekeepers, uh, uh, the situation would be that you and I and everyone else in the world uh, would have access to uh, uh, unmediated data and the truth uh, of things would emerge. Uh, I cannot think of anything so stupid uh, or silly. And I have to ask these people, and I'm almost serious about this. In fact, I'm quite serious. Haven't you ever heard of original sin? <laughs> yeah. Which needn't, which needn't have a theological uh, cast, although it usually does. It just has to, to uh, all you have to do is recognize what in fact the First Amendment does recognize is that the general fallibility of each of us. And also that means uh, the tendency not to operate uh, as some First Amendment rhetoric assumes that we will finally operate as rational deliberators or rational chooses, but rather to operate as people with interests that drive us, and most of those interests are base. Uh, so that's my view of the, that's my view of the world. That if you allow, uh, it's the mantra: the more speech, the better. Uh, that I am challenging, especially in the fifth chapter uh, 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 of this book, because it turns out now that we have the more speech, it's not the better. <laughs>
it's a lot worse. Now, of course, the response to that says is, well, what would you substitute in its place? I mean, what would you have us do? Well, again, that's not usually a question I'm willing to answer. <laughs> uh, what would you have us to do? All I'm doing is pointing out that what I call these techno-utopian hopes have never been realized, will never be realized, and any half-educated 14-year-old kid in 1970 should have realized that. So you, you actually um, sort of have this statement in here, which I'm looking for, but I'll, I had marked it. I'll come back to it, where you essentially talk about, really, the original sin of, of, of this speech theory. Um, so let's, let's move away um, from the internet for a second and move to one of my favorite topics, and I assume plenty of people in here, which is campus speech. Yeah, it's mine um, too, yes. Yeah, so we have a lot to talk about there. And, and before we sort of get into it, um, I don't know if, I don't, I'm not sure everyone here is aware of this, but today um, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Professor Fish has a op-ed saying, I wasn't censored when I was disinvited. And I'm hoping that you can just tell everyone a little bit about yeah. what happened with Seton Hall and, yeah. and then we can go from there. Floyd Abrams suggested that I had the op-ed planted just on this day, so as, to, <laughs> so as to be available on this occasion. Would that I had that kind of... Uh, well, uh, I uh, was called uh, earlier in the fall by a faculty member, who, also an administrator at Seton Hall, who told me that the university was about uh, to uh, install a new president and that it's part of the inauguration series. Uh, they were setting up uh, a number of lectures uh, devoted to uh, campus matters of various kinds, uh, and would I give the first of these lectures? Uh, and I said, uh, yes, that sounds very interesting. Uh, what date did you have in mind? Uh, he said, well, I'll come back with some dates and see if any of them uh, fits with your schedule. And a few weeks later, he did, did call me back, however, uh, not to uh, propose a date, but to tell me that the invitation had been withdrawn. And why was it withdrawn? Uh, I asked, <laughs> you might imagine. Uh, and he said it was because a committee, of which he was a member, but he wasn't in on the discussions because the committee never met in person but communicated by email. A committee had decided that mine were views that the Seton Hall audience should not hear. That was the reason. Uh, now, I can tell you what those views are. In fact, I can summarize those views uh, Please. In, in two very quick ways. One, the title of a 2008 book of mine, uh, and that title is Save the World on Your Own Time, uh, directed toward <laughs> university professors and administrators. And then the, uh, the, the second thing uh, that I often say uh, to those who believe, for example, uh, that social justice concerns should inform our teaching, uh, I say, Social justice is no doubt a very good thing, but it's not an academic good thing. Uh, so those are my views about the academy and the relationship of uh, academic speech to political concerns. And presumably the members of that committee who decided that uh, my, my voice was unworthy and should not be heard uh, knew of those views uh, because I haven't, I haven't made them. Uh, a secret. In good First Amendment spirit, I said to the person on the telephone who was uh, shamefacedly, although I couldn't see him, I could tell <laughs> that he was uh, unhappy to be delivering uh, this news, I said that I would be happy to come to Seton Hall in an informal way and talk to a bunch of people who were interested in these issues. Of course, no honorarium, no fuss, no nothing, uh, but I haven't heard anything in response yet. So, so you, I mean, in, in your op-ed, you suggest that this was a uh, regime of virtue. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's a regime of virtue in the following sense. Uh, there's grown up this idea uh, that there's a certain set of views uh, that are, uh, how shall we say, uh, de that, that define right-thinking persons. Uh, and they are views generally uh, on the left. Uh, they are views which, as views, uh, I generally hold. Uh, but the idea um, is that any form of discourse or uh, 
or a course of teaching that does not devote itself to these views uh, is to be rejected. Uh, and therefore classes, and this is a, something that happened at Williams College, uh, usually listed as the top liberal arts college in the country in most surveys. surveys. A large number of Williams College students have uh, signed a petition, which by the way is ungrammatical, but we won't dwell on that, have, have signed a petition in which they say that they, quote, pledge not to take any courses in the English department that do not have race at their center. Uh, and that seems to me to be exactly an example of everything that I find distressing about the current scene because what it does is put a political concern, a genuine political concern. No one is going to deny that race is an extraordinarily uh, important topic to be considered and explored. But to say that all courses must have race at their center uh, is, to, is, is to, in fact, perform in a way an old-style Soviet Union act um, in, in, in which the content of a course is politically imposed rather than allowing the content of the course to grow out of the material. So that was... So, um, Professor Fish, I saw a little bit of a, a tension between your view about the regime of virtue and your, your critique of the university as having, uh, as I read it, the administrators, not a freedom of speech issue, but the administrators and the faculty have complete freedom, really, to decide what goes on in their class. And that they are, if they want, if any individual professor wanted, con consistent with the constraints of, I suppose, their, their dean or their committee, wanted to require that every class, that their class is all dealt with race, that would be perfectly okay with you? Or, or am I misunderstanding something? Well, as I say in this editorial, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal piece today, the last class that I taught in, the, in a literature department was devoted to the poetry of the 17th century, five poets, Milton, Dunn, Marvell, uh, Ben Jonson, and George Herbert, each of whom is incomparably great. Uh, and you have to stop me from talking about it, because I could do that uh, forever. Uh, but, uh, and there are some components of their work that touch on questions of race. Uh, for example, Ben Johnson wrote a mask uh, that is a court presentation called The Mask of Blackness, in which Queen Anne and eleven of her ladies-in-waiting appeared in blackface. Uh, and that's worth talking about. And there are other uh, uh, statements made in the work of those poets uh, that might come under the, uh, uh, under the subheading of race. But there are very few of them. Uh, and if you were to teach that course and have it focused on race, you would in fact uh, be uh, ignoring everything uh, about the poetry that made it worthy uh, to be the subject of a university course in the first place. But, but, um, so that's what I'm saying there. So it, I w then at the end I say, if someone proposes such a course, 17th century poetry and race, I would, uh, and I were a dean, I would, or a department chair, and I've been both, uh, I would say, okay, Explain to me in academic terms how this course is going to work. And that by academic terms, I mean, don't tell me that race is an important topic. Who would deny it? Tell me how a focus on race is going to be adequate to the illumination of these poems. Perhaps a person could do it. And if the person couldn't do it, I would say, teach something else. But it would be within their 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 right or the right of the commission of the committee, the deanship, to decide what could be taught within that. Well, class it's and it's, not. it's usually departments work, at least in the uh, liberal arts world, uh, departments work where uh, courses uh, are uh, proposed to a departmental committee uh, on curriculum. And in general, in the academy, there are only two issues anyone cares about: one is curriculum, and the other is personnel that is whom to hire, fire, uh, or promote. So the cur curriculum committee is very important. And many battles are fought in, uh, in, in curriculum uh, committees. And always the battle takes the same shape. Is this course being proposed in line with the current wisdom uh, in the uh, discipline? Does it speak uh, 
uh, to the issues that our students uh, will have to uh, know when they go out uh, and attempt uh, to find uh, uh, jobs in other departments and other questions like that. So there's a filtering or vetting process uh, which greatly restricts the freedom of any instructor to teach what he or she likes. And of course, this vary, this, this changes over time. That is, is undoubtedly that the standards uh, by which these decisions are made uh, are, are, are not fixed in stone. Forty years ago, if you had proposed a course centering on the lyrics of Bob Dylan, it would not have been accepted. Now it will be accepted in a New York minute. Uh, and not only because he has somewhat improbably, I would say, received the Nobel Prize for <laughs> Literature. So um, I'm glad that you mentioned 40 years ago because one of the things that has struck me about campus speech is that these are not new ar arguments at all. No, no. And that, I mean, looking back, so I had the great pleasure of moderating at one of my reunions, um, a panel on free speech on campus at, at Yale and speaking with uh, the panelists included now Justice Brett Kavanaugh, but also Dean of the Faculty, Tamar Gendler, and uh, as well as uh, 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 Stuart Benjamin, who was, I don't know if he was at Duke when you were there, but no. in any case, a couple other people. But uh, uh, Dean Gendler expressed, well, so, so a couple things about that. First, in, this, in 74, Yale put out, uh, after a number of protests, uh, black nationalist protests, uh, uh, Shockley coming to campus and everyone getting upset, or not coming to campus, very, very similar. If you haven't looked at this, this the issues are exactly the same as, as what's happening now. And Yale uh, convened a, a group, a committee, and they put out, C. Van Woodward put out. I read that, yes. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the guidelines for the administration. Um, and it seems, having reread them in preparation for this and, and for this other panel, a, a complete, that things haven't changed, that this is not a new argument, at, to, down to the T. I mean, there was one dissent. Um, ultimately, it was a strong statement in favor of what they said was free speech on campus and civility and allowing people to come and speak. But there was a dissent, and the dissent basically said, um, you are not valuing the harm that the speech can cause in the short term. I mean, it's actually, it's it quoted Marcuse, it was a, it's a very, very similar arguments. And I'm wondering if you have any sort of reflection on the yeah, fact that these are the same arguments. My reflections are complicated. First of all, a couple of weeks ago, there was a nice session uh, at Cardozo Law School marking the publication of this very book, which I now happily look around to see yeah. once again. Uh, and someone rose during the question and answer period to say uh, that uh, her college, or perhaps it was a college of a friend of hers, had recently instituted a civility week. Uh, so I rose uh, then to say quite, uh, how shall I say, undiplomatically, that any college that I was a part of instituted a civility week, uh, I would uh, seriously contemplate resigning. I would also seriously contemplating resigning if it was a sustainability week, or worst of all, a diversity week, or any of those things, because they are not academic concerns. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, of course, that academics should be uh, should not be civil. It doesn't mean that in the classroom there should not be the usual uh, decorums of polite interactions between rational persons. <laughs> but it does mean that you cannot put these concerns front and center so that uh, the civility and the free speech arguments uh, don't do much for me. Again, because in my view, free speech is not an academic value. As I said, that's the key statement of mine in this chapter. Free speech is not an academic value. Uh, freedom of inquiry is an academic value, and that uh, value intersects with freedom of speech occasionally on the thin edge of a Venn diagram, uh, we uh, uh, might say. Now, as for the argument put forward that the speech of persons likely to be controversial and controversial in the direction of upsetting uh, particular groups of students um, and, uh, uh, and, and faculty. 
I think that that's the wrong way to frame the entire issue. And here I take my cue uh, from uh, a friend uh, and a noted First Amendment uh, theorist, Robert Post of Yale University, uh, who says in a set of arguments that he's been having uh, with Dean Irwin Cheraminsky uh, of, the United, of the University of California at Berkeley, uh, Robert Post says, look, the question to ask when a speaker or a panel is proposed, either by a student group uh, or by a department, the question is simple. Will this event contribute to the academic mission of the college and the university? Notice, that's not a question which goes to content. It's not a question which goes necessarily uh, to the degree that the speaker's words will be controversial. It's a question squarely centered on the academic mission. And that gives you a guideline, uh, says Post, and I agree with him, uh, that gives you a guideline uh, when you're attempting to decide, as an administrator, uh, whether or not uh, a, an invitation uh, to a certain group or set of speakers should either be made uh, or withdrawn. So I really believe that that's the way to go, that administrators uh, should in fact uh, cling fiercely uh, to the mission they are pledged to defend uh, and, to, uh, uh, and to have flourish. Now there is a, there is uh, a, a major difficulty with my position, or rather post position, as I have just articulated. It depends on there being a breed of administrators who know what they're doing and there aren't any. <laughs> uh, there are very, very few of them. Administrators, to say that administrators are like reeds in the wind, is to pay them a compliment. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the next stage of instability is, but they occupy it. Uh, entirely hopeless creatures. They haven't the slightest idea of what they're doing or why they're doing it. And then when they, uh, when, 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 <laughs> when they run into a problem, they run to their office of legal counsel, and the members of the office of the legal counsel are asking only one question. The liability question. And that's, of course, what they are paid to do, ask, to ask the, the liability question, because they want to protect uh, the university uh, from various uh, financial uh, claims. But once you do that, of course, you have again in another way lost hold of your essential mission. So that's my answer. I don't know if that's a... No, that, that's great. Uh, let me ask, ask you sort of a, a follow-up on that. So. There's also, so I read, and I had, it's not in the book, and, and so I might be wrong, that at one point in your career you were uh, essentially an advocate, you were in favor of speech codes on campus. So, so, so the question now, when we're, we all are in classrooms and we're all dealing with students who are, um, who occasionally might say, hey, that's triggering for me, or... I don't want to read this, or I, how do you know? I mean, I'm not allowed to serve alcohol in my graduate class anymore because somebody might have an alcohol problem. Um, I mean, uh, we, I mean, I'm not complaining about that. There's a re there, maybe that's the administration issue. Maybe it's a liability issue. Um, but you are. But I have spoken to professors who say, well, for these students, students who may not come from privileged background, however you define privilege. Who may be who are who are engaging who we want to engage in this inquiry, this this ultimate goal of the university, that we need to create a situation that they can pursue their own uh, that ultimately that they can pursue the situation of inquiry, and that means that we have to be sensitive to language that is directed yeah. against them. Uh, I'm curious as yeah, to I'm, what you I'm think about that. Yeah, I'm going to take only I'm going to answer in response to only one slice of that question. Mm -hmm. We may want to explore it. I feel no responsibility whatsoever for the deficiencies of my students. That's their problem. Now, those deficiencies, uh, someone, someone here is, you're, you're raising your hand and not a, 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 someone in the back is shaking her head uh, well, we'll with, come to that. We're with, gonna ask. with okay. equal vigor. Uh, one of the complaints uh, made by uh, those who pledged at Williams College uh, 
not to take any courses in the English department that were not centered on race. They also had a side complaint. And that side complaint, not in the, that document, but that emerged in the course of some interviews, and that side complaint was that some of the professors made some of the students feel uncomfortable uh, because they were being told that there are certain things they hadn't read and they should have read them. And the result was that students then uh, felt uh, uh, shamed, perhaps, uh, or at least uh, made ashamed. And then this was uh, this general piece of behavior on the part of some instructors uh, was attached uh, to the distinction between uh, first world students and perhaps third world students or students who had uh, been educated uh, at uh, first rate schools in this country and students who perhaps had not received the benefits uh, of uh, such an education. To that my reply is very simple. I considered it my job to make my students feel uncomfortable and to shame them. If they haven't read certain things, and I'm going to tell them that they haven't read certain things, and I'm going to say things like, what's the matter with you? How have you allowed yourself to get this far? Go out and read this stuff. Uh, and so, I do, I, and I don't believe, I simply don't believe uh, that it's part of our obligation uh, or responsibility as instructors to consider the different and various disabilities, except in the literal sense, of course. If there are literal disabilities, that's an entire matter, in part because it's a matter of law, but even more, it's a moral matter. But in, in terms of what we might call the social, uh, uh, the, the social or historical disabilities that have visited some persons and not others, I am not in any way sympathetic. I am willing to take the time with such students, as I am, for example, this semester in the course I'm teaching at Cardoza. So you let's meet for extra sessions, and we'll see uh, what I can do uh, in the way of pointing you in a direction that will be helpful to you. But the general idea that is from the very beginning, you're supposed to be sensitive to students in the realm of you know pronouns uh, or triggerings or anything like that. All of that vocabulary, triggerings, microaggressions, um, safe spaces, uh, cultural appropriation, all of that stuff, each one of those phrases simply is a statement that we don't want to learn anything. Please don't, in fact, try to teach us uh, anything. So that's, that's my view. Uh, of that, uh, of that. Look, the classroom. But all of these in in my classes, none of these problems ever arise. Uh, why? Because I tell the students from the beginning, we're engaged here in an academic activity, and then I explain what, at least in my view, an academic activity is, which is to take some topic um, or set of events or historical period uh, or whatever it might be and uh, uh, analyze it, examine it, see what its moving parts are, see whether those moving parts cohere together, and I already gave this list, uh, or something like it before. And that's what we do. That's what we do. We don't give our opinion. I tell my students from the very beginning of each class, I never want to hear your opinion on any subject under the face of the earth, uh, of the sun, rather. And I'm not going to give you my opinions either. I'm going to tell you things which I am authorized uh, to tell you uh, because of the training I've received and the work that I have done um, in the research archives and elsewhere. That's the, that's the currency uh, that, that, that we're going to exchange. The currency not of opinions, but of informed views about a very limited set of matters that form the subject matter of this course. And that's it. So I never want to hear anything about your opinions. I never want to hear anything about issues that seem important to you that are not, in fact, uh, directly related uh, to uh, the materials of this course. We're just going to, which, which is, we're just going to sit here and we're, we're going to, we're, we're going to function as <coughs> academics are supposed to function. Now they learn that. They learn that very quickly. They learn that very quickly. And so 
extraneous matters are not brought up uh, uh, in my classes. Uh, anyway. So, so I want to just give you a hypo. It's, I, it's in your book, but I'm going to change names and, and situations just to push on just a little bit to understand your view on this. So let's suppose you are a first year law student and you are taking a class with a professor who no problem in the, in the course, you know, the torts, what have you, contracts, nothing problematic going through the syllabus. But outside the class, this professor has expounded on why they don't think Jews should be lawyers um, or that they won't be very academically successful. Um, because she has never, or he's never seen a, a, a Jewish student who has done well in the first year of this class. Is the, I mean, I think I know the answer for having read the book, but is the administration of, and the tenured, let's say it's a tenured uh, faculty member, is the administration um, able to punish that, or fire that, that faculty member? Um, for for their spe for their out of classroom speech right. a and b could could you imagine a world where that that knowing for that first year student that their professor holds these beliefs even though they're not being expressed in the classroom but outside of the classroom that that could create a situation where it'd be difficult for them to study towards well let's let's begin with a matter of fact people have been dismissed mm -hmm. uh, for the reasons uh, that you enumerated so it certainly couldn't ha could happen should it happen. Uh, my answer would be no. And what in general you are asking, and some of you will have rec will recognize it, is the Amy Wax question. Uh, Amy Wax, a professor of law of many years uh, at, uh, uh, who's at, at University of Pennsylvania, argued before the Supreme Court on uh, multiple occasions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and she has, uh, in a variety of contexts, uh, uh, extracurricular contexts, conferences of various kinds, uh, given uh, uh, pr uh, articulated views uh, that uh, some of her students, and, or at least uh, some of those who learned about them, uh, feel uh, are so objectionable that they should uh, be used either to uh, discipline her by not allowing her, for example, uh, to teach in first year courses, or perhaps, uh, or perhaps uh, dismiss her. Uh, now, you have to give it to Amy Wax, that uh, the controversies that erupted around her in 2017, rather, uh, have not, in fact, slowed her down. Because as early as, or as recently as late July and early August of this year, uh, she has, uh, at a conference, spoken uh, in approval of what is known as cultural distance nationalism. How many of you know anything about cultural distance nationalism? Well, it's good to be able to tell a group of distinguished persons something <laughs> that they perhaps didn't know. Cultural, but as soon as I explain it, you will recognize it as an, an anti-immigration argument that you sometimes hear. It goes this way. One of the things that makes a society cohere uh, is if the members of it uh, all uh, have had a, a set of comparable experiences, uh, been introduced to the same texts or cultural uh, monuments, live in general the same kinds of life. It's that kind of coherence that creates the ties uh, that bind uh, and produce something that we usually call community. Uh, then the, ne the next step in the argument is to say that when we determine just who is going to be allowed into this country, uh, in our, that is in our immigration policy, and who is not going to be allowed, it would be better, so to Amy Wax and others, uh, to admit people from countries whose cultural profile is more like ours than it is like the cultural profile of some uh, of, of other cultures. Now, th this argument is being made, at least this is what Wax and her colleagues say, without any necessary prejudice against those other cultures. It's just that they're not like ours, and therefore their contribution to our culture uh, will not be as immediate and perhaps will never be made. The result, Amy Wack said in a sentence that should go down in history as something 
no one should utter without an armed guard, uh, she said, that will mean uh, that there should be more white people than people of color in this country. Now, of course, that was the statement that everyone seized on. Uh, but uh, her argument is an intellectual argument, uh, which, uh, in fact, uh, was made, uh, let's see, you know, this, I don't forget what year we're in now, but it was made 40 to 50 years ago by Arthur Schlesinger, uh, uh, of all people, a confidant and advisor of John F. Kennedy, uh, as many of you uh, will know. So having made that argument, in which the conclusion is this country would be better off with more white people than people of color, then the question is, if her students hear about this, and today, given the wonders of the internet, they, they, will, hear will, it, yeah. they will hear about this, what do you do? As if you're a dean, if you're her dean uh, in, in, in this uh, particular case, and my answer is, you don't do anything. Uh, if the question arises, and this is the tricky point, if the question arises as to whether or not she should be disciplined or dismissed for what she said, you, of course, as a dean or a provost, or let's say dean, you, of course, defend her rights as a citizen to give her views on matters of controversy. What you don't do, however, is what her dean then did and what most administrators reflexively do. They say, oh, of course, I myself, personally, me, dean of virtue, I condemn or disagree with or don't accept uh, Amy Wax's views. Once an administrator has done that, you know, if an administrator who was under my supervision had ever done that, he or she would be fired the next day because a line had been crossed. As an administrator, your job is to protect the free speech rights, that is the citizen rights of your faculty, and it doesn't include inserting your own personal view as to whether the views you are protecting are worth, uh, are, are worth holding. Uh, and in fact, what the dean at Penn did, uh, Ted Ruger, uh, what Ted Ruger did says that he, when he was speaking about her views, he was speaking as an academic, not a dean. When you're a dean, you can't speak. I was a dean. When you're a dean, you can't speak as an academic, not a dean. When you're a dean, what you say is heard quite properly as dean's speech, and you have to be very careful. This is another instance in my mind of why administrators, when dealing with questions like this, are generally hopeless and hapless. As I think Ruger was hopeless and hapless down the line in almost everything he said and did. Thank you. I, I mean, I have a follow-up, but I think it's actually a great time to open up to questions. Um, and oh, good, there are some questions. Floyd. Where to begin? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not clear how you decide what to mock and what to support. Why, for example, in your very first examples here, uh, can you hear there? Sorry. Uh, one of your two examples at the start was an executive <coughs> of a basketball team right, right. in the NBA who spoke out in favor of freedom for people in Hong Kong. And you mocked that person, right? Because the business of a team is to make money. I don't understand why you are on the side of their making money instead of your being on the side of an executive speaking out in a freedom supporting way. And similarly, I'll just put it together and mm -hmm. then yield to you. Uh, in your football example, uh, why are you not on the side of saying, you know, I would admire a football team that permitted my quarterback to kneel 
as a way of expressing uh, his views about matters of social conscience. Uh, and when you respond by saying, but they may lose money, they may have fans angry at them, I don't understand what, how you've chosen all right. To be on that side. I, first of all, I didn't. I wasn't mocking Mr. Morey. Oh, that was his name. Were, oh, no, no, no. I was mocking those who cried free speech when uh, responding to, to the uh, backlash uh, in China and elsewhere against what he said. He, of course, had every right to say what he said. I'm just saying that the uh, that the team, uh, the Houston Rockets, and and the NBA. Uh, had also every right uh, to uh, discipline him for having said it, uh, and that's because uh, that that's because and I'm simply and I'm repeating myself here uh, that they are not that these 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 businesses are not in the business of enhancing free speech rights. They're in the business of growing the enterprise. Now there could be a calculation. This is a calculation that Adam Silver made uh, in the NBA. The, 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 mm -hmm. go, go ahead, Will. We'll that Adam back. Silver made uh, in 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 the uh, uh, in 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 the same uh, situation. He decided to speak out for free speech because he was speaking to an audience of concerned legislators like Mitch McConnell who wanted. The enterprise, that is the National Basketball Association, to display the right patriotic American values. I don't fault Adam uh, for what was his last name? Silver. Silver for speaking out for free speech rights at that moment. I just hope that he was insincere in doing so. <laughs> that is, I hope that he didn't mean it. That he was making a calculation that began and ended with his responsibility to grow the enterprise. So here I allow myself in general with uh, Michael Jordan, uh, who said uh, when someone asked him at the, uh, uh, at the uh, apex uh, of his career, why did he not speak out on social issues and especially uh, on issues that uh, involved uh, matters uh, of race and marginalization. And his response to uh, that question was, they, meaning all the people that you would have me speak out against, they buy sneakers too. Now, he was mocked, to go back to Floyd's word, for that answer. That was the right answer. Why? Hmm? Why? What do you was mean? Was it the right answer? It's the right answer because it's not his business as a basketball player. Uh, to It's not his business as a basketball player. Uh, to be using his influence uh, to advance social issues. Look, when I wrote the 2008 book, Save the World on Your Own Time, I didn't argue against people who wanted to save the world. I said, just don't do it on the university's dime, because that's not what you were either paid for or trained for. And I would say the same, uh, I, I would say the same, uh, in, in the context of the uh, Michael Jordan and the other athletic uh, examples uh, we've uh, been referencing. So I have no objection to people who are athletes uh, to also, in effect, after school, doing whatever kind of work that they thought was good. I just don't think you, could, you should confuse the two. Uh, to put it in an ungenerous, that is ungen unflattering rather, way to me, I am an inveterate compartmentalizer. I believe in compartmentalization, and a lot of people don't, including my wife, uh, but that's a whole other story. Uh, I believe in compartmentalization, that when you're doing a task, whatever it is, you do that task. And when you're doing some other task, you do that task. And that usually, mixing the two is uh, at best a category mistake and at worst, a disaster. So let me just ask you, coming back to, to Professor Wax, if it turned out that applications to the University of Pennsylvania's law school fell off the cliff, 
um, because people did not want to associate themselves for whatever reason with faculty there. Mm -hmm. um, would the university, the law school, be uh, entitled to therefore say, you know, Professor Wax, we'll pay out your contract, but we can't have you here anymore? No. They have to bite the bullet uh, in that case. Why? Yeah. Because if they were to do as you, know, you hypothetically suggested, they would have been surrendering to a political demand. Uh, they would have been tailoring their behavior to an extra academic form of pressure. And that's what I think you should never do. Tailor your behavior to an extra academic form of pressure unless you're a professional fundraiser and that's your job. <laughs> or unless, the, unless you're the head of, unless you work for the public relations office of a university, which people who do so must occupy some circle in Dante's hell. Uh, but if, if that's the kind of work that you've decided to do, you've signed up to be duplicitous. That's your job. So um, uh, there was a, a... There are lots of people. There are a lot of questions. But not, George, not yet. The, the woman right here in the scarf had a question before. Do you still have a question? Yeah. I, was, I was interested in your talk about seeing how this environment mm -hmm. felt about it. Uh, and how, what, if you did anything about it to correct, correct that? No, I didn't do anything about it. I just, as, as I said, I offered to come to the school on another occasion, less, uh, you know, less august and formal than the installation of a new president, and talk to those people who regarded my ideas as um, disturbing enough to uh, wish to ban them from campus. And then I would, you know, I'd say, okay, what do you think I mean, and why do you think what I say is so dangerous and wrong, and let's, let's talk it out. Otherwise, I didn't do anything until today, but today I outed them uh, in the Wall Street Journal, which does have a readership. Uh, so, and that was a calculated act, and I refrained from doing that for a little while, but finally I decided, what the hell? Uh, especially when the Williams College example, when I saw that the Williams College stuff and what had happened to me could be put together, my old instincts as an op-ed writer just came to the fore. <laughs> and I... Regarding these sports, there's been a long history of defiance in sports, whether it's a Billie Jean King, yeah. the Ash, the Munich Olympics. So protest makes a difference when you have that kind of power. Well, I would distinguish the Billie Jean King from the Olympic protests, for example. What Billie Jean King was saying, and she did say to Jack Kramer uh, and others at the time, look, this is going to be good for the game. What you guys are doing is not good for the growth of tennis. We are going to set up something, and you will see how successful it will be. And she, of course, was right. The women's tennis game, even today, is infinitely more interesting, at least in the United States, uh, than the men's tennis game, where there are no men's tennis players in the United States worth watching uh, these uh, worth watching uh, these days. But in other words, she was thinking in terms of the profession. Now, uh, the uh, two black athletes who raised their hands at the Olympics uh, were not thinking of that. They wanted to make a statement, and they did make a statement. And, and, and making that statement cost them something. So uh, I say that the cost that they paid uh, is, is something that uh, uh, no one should apologize for. They decided to go outside the precincts of the enterprise that was, as it was then uh, being engaged in. We're not going to play by the rules of the game. Uh, we're going to uh, introduce uh, a, another set of concerns uh, and in effect, uh, put them in and, and shove them in people's faces. Uh, the fact that uh, that there were negative repercussions uh, from that are exactly uh, what one would expect. But again, I would distinguish this uh, from the uh, Billy King, uh, Billy Jean King uh, activism. Um, okay, so what we're going to, George, I'm going to ask, take your question, and then we're going to ask in, uh, if DC has any questions, and then we'll come back. To New York, since there are more people here anyway. Um, but go ahead, George. First of all, as an Aris guy, I totally agree with your analysis of Williams. But beyond that, um, I don't understand if, if the object of the of the NBA is to make money, why would the object of the University of Pennsylvania to make is to make money 
And so if students were applying uh, in less lesser numbers because mm -hmm. of this professor, it would seem to me under your theory they would have the exact same right to get rid of that professor because they're economically costing the university money. Well, second, second question simply is, in the NBA, you said the NBA's balance to making money is not a free speech right. And even if we grant you that, isn't there something to be said for a right to instill democracy across the globe instead of dictatorial rule and a tyrannical rule in another country? Would well, that, that's, a huge, that's a huge value that you would view over money? The second question is a huge one, and it goes to the issue of whether or not we think that by flying planes over third world or Middle Eastern countries um, and uh, dropping hundreds and thousands of copies of John, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty is going to do any good. And my answer to that question is no. We tried that, starting with President Wilson and going up to a couple of administrations ago. We tried that. But that's a, an issue almost too large, I think. Uh, for the parameters of our discussion uh, today. Uh, when you were, um, uh, oh yeah, in response to the first part of your question, or in your first question, I would say that it's not the business of universities to make money. I would also say it's not the business of universities not to make money, and there's a distinction there, that the university wants to grow its endowment so that it can support educational activities. But the educational activities come first, not the making of the money. So that I think that any, uh, I think that any demand made upon, I've already said this, any demand made upon a university which has it marching to a drummer different than the drummer of the, uh, uh, of the imperatives of the educational enterprise must be rejected. Now to say that raises a question that I have not answered. Well, what are the parameters of the educational enterprise, and who is to say what they are? Now, here I want to say exactly what I say about free speech in general in this book, that there's no platonic ideal of education. In fact, the platonic ideal of education in Plato's dialogues is pretty coercive and repressive, uh, but that's a whole other matter. There's no platonic idea uh, of uh, education. There are just competing views of education uh, which have uh, been with us uh, for centuries. And I align myself with a tradition, uh, the tradition that makes up one of those competing views. Uh, it begins, the tradition that I align myself with, uh, begins with the 10th book of Aristotle's Ethics. Uh, in which he uh, uh, expands on a distinction between the contemplative, contemplative life uh, and other forms of life uh, that involve activity uh, of a certain kind, uh, commercial, political, whatever it might be. Uh, and he, Aristotle, says the contemplative life is most like the life that is lived by the gods. Uh, I'm not going to make that claim. Uh, but he does say that there should, in fact, be uh, an area in which contemplation and turning over ideas and examining them uh, rather than assessing them on the way to taking some kind of action, political or otherwise, uh, is the prime uh, uh, content. Uh, uh, later on, but in the same tradition, uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, in his text, uh, The Contest of the Faculties, uh, said that there has to be a place there has to be an activity in which questions of the political and of power do not arise. Uh, um, Cardinal Newman said the same thing at the, uh, in the idea of a university. And perhaps the best statement of it, at least the most succinct, was made by the uh, sociologist Max, Max Weber, um, who in a 1918 uh, essay uh, called Science as a Vocation, uh, says that it's perfectly appropriate in a political setting to canvas your audience to see where their views lie and then try to, uh, and, and, and then tailor your discourse uh, uh, in accordance with those views. But he said, to do that in an academic setting would, to be, would be to violate uh, the very essence 
uh, of, uh, of uh, the academic enterprise. So I believe that. Uh, I believe in the rigorous separation of all things political uh, uh, from the workings of the academy. And I say that despite the obvious fact that no college or university has ever existed except by leave of, and indeed in many places by virtue of, the operation of politics. That is, universities and colleges depend in innumerable ways for their funding, for the utilities that they tap into, uh, for their charters, uh, et cetera, et cetera, on the political world, which they must then, in my view, rigorously turn away from. Uh, when I was a dean, uh, one of the things a dean uh, is supposed to do, uh, in fact, it's probably 30% of, uh, of your charge, is to give welcoming remarks. That is, there are all kinds of conferences on campus in your college, and I had a college of uh, 30 departments and uh, you know, innumerable buildings and so forth. I was always going to uh, departments or, or, or parts of the university and speaking to people uh, whose uh, expertise uh, was not in any area uh, that I could even approach. But I decided nevertheless to try to say something to all of these people. I wanted to make welcoming, welcoming remarks into an intellectual genre. Uh, and one time when I did that, my welcoming remarks were being given at a luncheon celebrating the inauguration at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where I was dean, of a Native American studies program. There had never been a Native American studies program at the university, and this was back, uh, this was back uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. There weren't that many Native American uh, studies programs anywhere. So here's what I said to those uh, at the luncheon. I said, none of you would have been here celebrating this occasion were it not for your political activism. Your political activism was what brought you to this table and also what opened up the opportunity to have a center for the study of Native American concerns. Political activism is what brought you here. Now forget about it. Because political activism, if you continue to perform it in the classroom, in your work, will lead you to be marginalized and no one will pay any attention to you because you will not be acting as an academic. Uh, they didn't like that. Hmm. Oh. But uh, I loved it, <laughs> obviously. I mean, well, let's go to Washington. Um, does anyone in DC have a question? And if you do have a question, could you introduce yourself um, before you ask it? They look very sober. What's that? Uh, can you hear me? I yes. have one. Uh, I'm Ron Collins. Hi, Stanley. It's hey, been hi. A case since we've seen each other. Yeah. Um, I just don't know where to begin. <laughs> <laughs> I was having this fantasy of, of you debating Captain McKinnon and Alan Bloom, uh, but <laughs> for the moment, it seems to me that this image is going to stick in my mind, Ron. <laughs> This image is going to stick in my mind. That's exactly what I wanted to do. <laughs> uh, so, but, but let me ask you this. It seems to me that your view of the university is a, a utopian, unrealistic one. Day in and day out, universities across this country defer uh, and allow the commercialization of the university when it comes to funding for the sciences. I mean, really? I mean, you don't think that they, day in and day out, yield to big money that funds medical schools, dental schools? Do I think that they don't? No. Do I think that they should? No. Uh, when I was a dean, the chairman of the biology department, who is now actually the provost at Hunter College, which is just one of those interesting things that happen in academic life, came to me as dean to say that he was worried about the kinds of funds that were pouring into or were potentially coming into his department. 
He was worried about not only their source, but even more about the possible influence those funds would have on the direction that scholarship took in his biology department. He was right to have that concern. What you're saying, what you're saying, and perhaps it was all even uh, that early, the horse was already out of the barn. Uh, what you're saying is that, in fact, that's what's happened. What I'm saying is that's too bad, and administrators should stop it. Administrators should stop it. University administrators, I know this is a hobby horse I keep harping on, university administrators used to be strong, self-confident, visionary people. They no longer are. And if they were, they would step in and make sure that this kind of thing wasn't happening. There used to be a rule in the academy that you didn't inquire into the source of the funds being offered you, unless, of course, they came from an illegal source, then you couldn't take them. But if they came from a legal source, you could accept them so long as you did not accept any strings that might be attached to the funds. But it has become increasingly clear, as you say, Ron, that strings are more and more attached, to which I can only... Sam, can I just leave you with this thought? I'm going to leave you with a word of Machiavellian realism. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Others will tell you what the world should be, yeah. but I will tell you what it is. And it seems to me that's exactly what's happened with the sciences and the university. So this dichotomy that somehow the universities are above commercialization just strikes me as a utopian one, however admirable. Above is the wrong preposition, as I often tell my students. Uh, above is the wrong preposition in this case, not because it's grammatically wrong, but because its content is wrong. I don't believe that the university is above anything. I believe that the university is a thing distinct from other things. And therefore, its primary task is to cultivate and protect that distinctiveness. I sometimes call this the doctrine of the distinctiveness of tasks, which in fact I stole from a professor of law uh, at the University of Toronto, Ernest Weinrib, who developed it in a brilliant article in the Yale Law Review in the late 80s on the doctrine of formalism. Uh, but the distinctiveness of tasks uh, is, my, uh, is, is my guiding lodestar. Figure out what it is that you're doing. What is the task assigned to you, either by history uh, or by society, and do it. Uh, I have a three-part mantra uh, that, to my mind at least, captures this obligation. Do your job. That is, do the job that you were paid to do and trained to do. Two, don't do anyone else's job. That is, don't, as if you're an academic, don't become a preacher or a guru uh, or a political agent or a therapist or any of those things. And then the third thing is don't let anyone else do your job. And of course, if you fail on one or two, you're setting yourself up for three. That is, you're setting yourself up for someone else uh, coming in and taking over uh, your uh, territory. Uh, and there's a kind of territorial fierceness about my uh, stance, uh, which should be acknowledged, although I assume it was already obvious. <laughs> um, so uh, I, it, it is getting close to the time we're going to end, so I want to No, make, no, we no, should no, 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 keep I want to keep going. going. So <laughs> I, want, I do want to see if there's another question in D.C., and then I want to come back to New York. Uh, so are there any other questions in D.C.? You've cowed them into uh, silence. Oh, okay. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor Fish. I'm hi, Bob you do. I practice uh, First Amendment law. Uh, and I'm, I'm intrigued by your premise, and if I'm reading it correctly, in your current book, it's the same one you espoused 25 years ago, and there's no such thing as free speech, and it's a good thing, too. That's right. That there's no such thing as a First Amendment principle. Yeah. That it's really just a contest of competing political views, and that... Uh, free speech theorists are just trying to advance a political agenda. Now, earlier you had claimed the prerogative of, a, of an author to read a few lines of your book. Uh, I'll claim the prerogative of a reader and yeah. do the same. Yes, that's a, pro that's a primary prerogative. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
where it says there is no general free speech principle, and the label of free speech is applied by polemicists to speech practices that affirm the values they already hold. This is the speech that should be uttered freely without restrictions because it is things I agree with. Uh, two questions, actually. One is, <clears throat> if that were true, would any uh, free speech advocates ever champion views that they disagree with? And my experience is we do it all the time. Uh, Wait, the is, why does that follow? I'm, I wasn't sure about the reasoning there. Well, it, it, the reading is you're saying that uh, people are advocating free speech principles only because it supports the views they already have. Mm -hmm. And yet my experience has been that free speech advocates do that all the time. They, they continually will defend the rights of people with whom they profoundly disagree. Uh, and uh, it's not hard to come up with examples. No, no. I need to. You're familiar with them all. Uh, the second question is this, because it seems to me that people who advocate mainly current academics who advocate for limiting First Amendment rights are the ones who will try and define the First Amendment in terms of certain values that it serves and then say that there are certain other things that it doesn't serve and therefore they can be censored. Mm -hmm. uh, but doesn't that get the proposition backwards? The First Amendment doesn't say we protect free speech because of these values. It prohibits censorship, which is really quite tangible. And so First Amendment law has de developed through a series of episodes of pushing back against various governmental actions that limit speech. And while that might not prefer, uh, present or create a perfectly intellectually satisfying body of law, uh, it is one that has developed over time and has developed to look, provide increasing levels of protection for the First Amendment and for free speech in general. So I, I, I guess the question is, isn't there such a thing as a First Amendment principle? Uh, no. Uh, there are a set of competing accounts of what a First Amendment principle might be uh, and uh, what it is that the First Amendment uh, is instituted uh, or was uh, put in place uh, to advance and protect. For some, it's, as you know, it's the facilitation of the search for truth or the fashioning of an informed citizenry, opening up a space uh, for uh, dissent, allowing the free flow of information in a democratic conversation. Those are just some of the candidates that have been put forward. Uh, and if, I could clarify, if I could clarify the question just a bit, isn't the question not what the First Amendment was designed to protect, but what the First Amendment was designed to prevent? Uh, I would say no to that. Uh, I think that the First Amendment, no, let me, let me finish my response and then perhaps you could come back because I think your point is a strong one. Uh, I always want to ask my students to consider the question, what is the First Amendment for? And my answer, and, and once I get a series of answers which more or less correspond to the list that both you and I uh, have given, I make the following statement. If you have any answer whatsoever to the question, what is the First Amendment for, you are logically committed to censorship because some of the values that you think are furthered by the First Amendment will indeed be inhibited or hindered by certain forms of speech. That is, there will be certain forms of speech which rather than facilitating the free flow of information, block it. Or rather, or rather than contributing to the fashioning of an informed uh, citizenry, uh, will in fact contribute to the, to the fashioning uh, of narrow and bigoted minds. And so that at that moment, in order to be true to the First Amendment, I argue, uh, you must indeed limit speech. Because it's only by limiting speech, that, that is by limiting speech, uh, that you can, in fact, be faithful to whatever it is that you have decided. What is that? Is that? Yes, yeah, whoever whispering in Washington, we can we can hear it. Uh, okay. So whatever answer that you give to the question, what is the First Amendment for, uh, will necessarily involve you, as I've already said, uh, in having a negative view of forms of speech uh, that uh, undermine what you have taken the what you do have decided the First Amendment is for. And that would include if you decided that the First Amendment uh, is for 
uh, the protection of speech against censorship. Uh, you would then have to invite. You would then uh, have to investigate. Uh, you know, the, inve the You would then have to investigate the conditions under which this protection, the, un under which this protection. Uh, under which this protection uh, uh, can be maintained. And here I always quote, because uh, it's been with me for so long, uh, the example of Milton in his great uh, prose work, The Areopagitica, which along with John Stuart Mill's On Liberty is usually cited as one of the cornerstones of uh, modern First Amendment doctrine. And as you know, those of you, uh, uh, I'll remind you, uh, of the content of, of the Areopagitica. It's, a, it's an eloquent uh, celebration of the freedom of speech and of the dangers of stifling truth. Uh, and it's an, elo an eloquent uh, plea uh, that works not be censored in advance, and et cetera. And three quarters of the way through the tract, Milton says, of course, I don't mean Catholics. Them, them we extirpate by which that means, that's a word that means, as you will know, tear up by the roots. What's the reasoning there? He wants to protect free speech from censorship, but he decides that a whole group of persons, Catholics, are in the business of indeed stopping the flow of free speech in any number of matters. Therefore, he concludes, they must be stopped. I want to say that all arguments for free speech are like that, and that no one in the history of the world, except perhaps for Mr. for Floyd Abrams and my uh, colleague and friend William Van Alstein, no one in the history of the world, except for these two noble exceptions, has ever been for free speech in and of itself, largely because such a thing, at least by my reasoning, doesn't exist. And I will say that uh, Professor Fish does actually explain all of that in this book. Um, so, um, all right. So, any? Uh, let's come back to New York. Are there any final questions in New York? Yes. Um, I, I'm just looking at your chapter three. Why? So I haven't read it. Maybe you want to chapter three. Why freedom of speech is not an academic value. What I'm curious about is why you're not talking about academic freedom and how that, mm -hmm. and where that exists sure. alongside freedom of inquiry and freedom of speech. Oh, thank you. I wrote a book in 2014 on academic freedom called Versions of Academic Freedom from Professionalism to, Resolute, to Revolution. The point of that book was to rescue academic freedom from being a noble concept. Uh, this, this will sound. This will sound odd. You need to downgrade it. No, I, I, I thought there are two ways of thinking about academic freedom. Either it's a noble concept which is has some strong relationship to freedom in general, or it's a guild, G U I L D, guild desire. You know, my Rhode Island pronunciation sometimes gets in the way of comprehension. Uh, it's a guild desire uh, to. Uh, protect your enterprise from outside interference and make sure that whatever decisions are being made, you, that is the insiders, are making them. That's what academic freedom is. It's a guild enterprise, and it's an enterprise which only protects academics when they're acting as academics. Well, they ex protect extramural speech. Expect, well, it, well, no, it expects extramural speech, but only because you are then being protected as any citizen would be. But in far as the doctrine is invoked in the university, in my mind, it can only be legitimately invoked in relation to the performance of academic duties. So if you do something in your classes, like bringing your own political views to the fore, or, or elaborating on your hobby horse, whatever it might be, you should not be protected by academic freedom because at that moment you're not acting as an academic. So academic freedom can only be claimed by people who are doing things, acting in ways that are recognizably academic. Typically, who's, who's going to? I mean, I'm going to make it. 
Yeah. The answer. No, no, no. I'm sorry. You are trying to figure out how to teach a particular. You are trying to teach about the poets. Right. Who decides what goes into that? I mean, you you fall within the general criteria set by your. But do you not have any leeway? You have leeway with. Yeah, you have leeway within the precincts of the profession. For example, all of the poets that I named, uh, 17th century poets, have an interest in astrology. And in order to understand what they write, uh, especially the poetry of George Herbert, it's important that you know something about astrology. Therefore, as a teacher, it's appropriate for you to teach astrology as a subject matter and as a historical component of the production of this poetry. It is not, however, within your right as an academic to teach astrology as a system in which we should believe. That's the distinction. Any, any topic can be brought into the classroom so long as it's taught in an academic way. But so, so let's say a professor decides to teach these five poets but to not talk about astrology, is that within their purview? Are they allowed to do yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, you could do that. For instance, so, so what, they do have yeah, sure, sure. They do have discretion. For instance, when I teach Milton, and actually all of those poets, but especially Milton, I teach a theological Milton, because theology is what I'm interested in, and I'm interested in the relationship between uh, Protestant theology and poetry um, as it develops in the, in the first 60 to 70 years of the 17th century. Other people that I know teach a Freudian Milton, uh, or uh, a Milton uh, who is politically involved as he was uh, in the partisan politics of the English Revolution between 1640 uh, and 1660. And there are seven or eight others at least possible, uh, possible uh, approaches. But how about Milton and the Chicago Bulls? I don't think so. <laughs> but, but, but you're picking some really big... Joan, Joan. Okay, oh, we're, we're going to... Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up on one thing that uh, Professor, Professor Fish said, which I heard very carefully, which is do your job. And my job is to try and make sure we get out of here close to on time, and we're already, we've already blown that. Oh, so yeah. I'm going so, so. to take the, the prerogative to say thank you so much to Lynn. Thank you so much to Professor Fish. Please join me in thanking him. Thank you, thank you.